Okay. Hello again, everyone from my side uh, to our virtual brain and clinical research um, fall school. And the session we have today is about workflows on GDPR compliant platforms, virtual research environment and health data cloud. So before we begin talking about uh, about digital platforms. For, so the structural connectivity um, are primarily these white matter fiber bundles that connect different brain areas via long distances. But we also have connectivity between neighboring populations. And um, this we use to arrive then at such an abstract and aggregated description of the brain network. And so again, we have this diffusion MRI tractography in order to extract structural connectomes. So this is a structural description of the brain network, um, the input for our brain network simulation, so to say. And the output or one of the outputs, so we can, of course, um, compute um, all kinds of outputs like um, neural time series, EEG, MEG, fMRI. And here, one um, output we are particularly interested in, uh, functional connectivity matrices, um, which is the, in its simplest form, it's just a region by region correlation between brain areas. Um, and yeah, we will later again touch on some um, brain network modeling um, related results. But for today, the main focus of our session is the place where we can securely process this data. And um, we are specifically talking about the VAE, the virtual research environment that we have here at Charité and the health data cloud, uh, which is a uh, further development of the VAE, which is part of eBrain's services for sensitive data. <clears throat> so this, uh, um, projects are developing such that the ultimate goal or, or one of the goals is to have an interoperable research platform uh, research network of such platforms basically where researchers can exchange data and metadata and securely process data together so we um, mention um, several different platforms during the course of this talk so um, let's um, uh, mention again the three most important platforms we are talking about here. It's the virtual research environment. So this is a specific platform that we have here at Charité. Then the health data cloud, which is a further development of the VIE and will be installed at various hospitals and research institutes. And eBrains is um, a larger um, platform, which not only provides services for health research, but also, for example, data and atlases, modeling and simulation, validation, inference ser services. The um, eBrains platform was one of the results of the Human Brain Project and integrates um, many uh, tools and um, approaches for uh, neuroscience research. So what is the specific purpose of the VIE and the HDC? It's, uh, they are cloud platforms that um, shall enable biomedical research that protects the privacy of the research participants. Since 2018, we have the general data protection regulation in the EU and derived from that national laws in each of the member states that um, regulate how personal data and especially health data, which is uh, data that relates to the um, health of a person um, has to be treated within uh, the European Union or from European citizens. And um, these technical, these platforms basically offer a technical implementation of these legal requirements because it's really complex um, to comply with the law and to enable biomedical research So what specifically do the VIE and the Health Data Cloud offer? There is a, a graphical user interface 
which allows you to work with data and file systems, very similar to how people are using um, a normal laptop or a normal computer. So you have a file explorer, you can manage files, you can um, give them a certain structure, you can annotate metadata and um, in a structured way, uh, share these data with your colleagues. And you can also then um, process this data in a private cloud computing space. So every team of researchers gets a private virtual machine, a set of cores and storage and memory that allows to process the data in isolation from others, but together as a team. So this is very similar. In the past, maybe, um, you know, uh, in, um, in science labs and research labs worldwide, you typically had a, a Linux cluster standing somewhere around and everyone had a login on this cluster um, from the lab. And um, this cluster had maybe, let's say 50 cores or 100 cores. And um, the, the whole lab team could use this cluster in order to uh, create a scientific output. But here now, um, since uh, 2018 and GDPR, um, there are much more, um, yeah, there's much more care needed in order to work with such data. And this is the specific purpose of these platforms. They implement or they um, structure these um, processing operations such that um, data breaches and mistakes don't happen so easily. So this is um, one big purpose and as mentioned, uh, we have um, graphical and also command line interfaces for these platforms that allow efficient operation um, to comply with GDPR and also to achieve peer-to-peer um, -peer interoperability and automated ingestion of research data. So there's also automation possible. So since this was born out of a uh, hospital, um, of course, um, we are interested in interfaces that connect hospital data sources like image servers that have um, patient imaging data, like radiologic imaging data, like MRI or X-ray, uh, or um, uh, uh, patient information, um, uh, patient data um, that can be pulled then from such hospital servers and securely ingested uh, and shared with researchers to perform research on these data. And all under the umbrella of of fairness. So um, it's important that these platforms have built-in mechanisms to make data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, which is a big um, problem um, of scientific data um, uh, and um, which is here solved by uh, annotations, metadata, standardization into common um, file formats, the lossless tra tracking of provenance, um, which is the digital history of a file, and also version control. Um, so to uh, store and be able to recapitulate the history uh, and evolution of data sets. Um, as mentioned, the Health Data Cloud um, then uh, builds on the VIE in a way that um, it makes it more easily deployable and um, usable at different sites, such that these different sites can then be connected into a federated research data ecosystem that enables the exchange of um, neuroscience or other medical data, um, uh, as mentioned under this FAIR umbrella, and also seamless access to high-performance computing and um, uh, uh, for, for processing of uh, more complex modalities. So to achieve uh, fairness, um, as mentioned, and we will see uh, many uh, concrete examples soon, to achieve this fairness, um, annotation with metadata is highly important. So a big problem of um, scientific research is that Researchers don't understand the outputs of other researchers because um, these other researchers didn't have the time to or um, didn't um, know how to specify the data in a way that it communicates all the scientific knowledge and all the um, yeah details basically that need to be communicated in order to meaningfully work with uh, such data. And it often boils down to very simple things which 
then in the end cost a lot of time and therefore there have been enormous efforts worldwide to change our research landscapes in a way that such um, exchange of data, curated data, that is really clearly, um, that can be clearly understood um, is a big focus. So well, since I started now with a bit of a um, theoretical introduction, let's have a really hands-on view now how the VIE specifically looks like. So when you uh, come on the landing page, um, you uh, can you can here um, get some support or documentation um, about the VIE. Um, these are um, links that are uh, directly accessible from the landing page, but the actual um, uh, contents of the data uh, of the platform, the actual data, um, can only be accessed after. Uh, clicking on a login button so this video is a bit slow i fast forward a bit so these are these resources that are used to build the vie at charite here we are link have links to user guides and at the top right uh, we can log in so there's access control to protect um, the data from um, uh, um, undesired or uh, unlawful access. And after you enter in such a project, so a project is the structure that brings together a team of researchers with a certain sensitive data set. And um, you have the typical file explorer functionality that you also have on your local computer. So here we start with some statistics at the top, um, also an overview over the files. Um, that were uploaded and ingested in the system such that um, um, data controllers, which are the persons that are responsible um, for compliance or mostly, uh, um, yeah, they decide the means and purposes of the processing, therefore have a large share of the responsibility that they can really monitor and structurally um, or govern basically the sharing of data. So as you can see here, for example, we have this copy to core functionality. So you cannot just upload data and expose it to others. There's this staging area, the green room, where you can upload data, but no one will see it. To um, expose data to others, you have to go this structured process of copy to core and to uh, make it available in the core zone, basically. And um, uh, which is a tracked operation, basically. So here something happens that is really related to uh, data protection. Then, and um, with this, the compliance with the law can be demonstrated for researchers because it's clear how the data flows, who are the responsible persons, who shares which part of the responsibility and performs which part of the work, basically, um, which yeah helps to demonstrate compliance. Uh, so the project view is the one major view. We have also data sets, um, which are, um, as the name suggests, data sets where we have files, basically, that are annotated with metadata. So you have the actual data, and then you have data about this data that describes this data. And with metadata, we can... Um, so for example, here we um, use metadata that is based on standards that are related to neuroscience ontologies. So that um, where it's clearly defined uh, what different words mean basically and um, which relationships they have in, um, in such a um, ontological fashion basically. So you can um, have trees basically. I think there's a chat message. Um, so I would probably um, collect all questions and until the end or, or something like uh, 1810 or so and would then address all questions um, uh, together, basically. Um, okay, then, um, yeah, here we see um, activity. So things that happen to such a data set. So here provenance, the digital history, of the data set is tracked and uh, can be um, recapitulated. Uh, here we can release versions of the data set um, to have um, immutable snapshots uh, where we exactly know what is contained and um, 
yeah, can share this then with others. So back to the project, we can, uh, of course, search for files um, by um, yeah, different um, search operators or categories like file name, um, upload date, and so on, and then can concatenate here uh, these, um, these uh, um, queries to build complex queries. And with this, um, effectively um, search the platform. So this is a um, feature for creating announcements, a way to communicate um, short-lived information with the project team. Here we can um, manage the members of the projects. Uh, here we can um, define metadata templates and generally um, configure settings of the project. Um, here we can um, yeah, create or answer uh, copy to core requests, basically. So um, we will see later how exactly this works. Um, here, basically, uh, the controllers of data, we don't see much right now, but later we will see it um, uh, better. Uh, can exp explicitly um, define which data sets are being onboarded and which not. Uh, here, an important tool is Guacamole, um, which gives you a remote desktop um, on this private virtual machine that belongs to the project that I mentioned earlier. So up to now, we have only seen places to store data, and this is now really the place where we can actually process data. So this is a virtual machine where only the project team has access, which has um, between 8 and 32 cores, and can also request more cores if needed and um, a certain amount of uh, memory and that can be used for processing. What we are currently seeing is um, JupyterHub, which is a more lightweight variant of such a processing facility, uh, which is specific to the user, where no other user has access. And here, um, the XWiki, the, the um, last uh, major item of the project view, is a um, um, rich text editor, which allows to create um, yeah, detailed documentation about the work that was performed in such a project. Uh, at the top right, we have this um, support um, panel to um, yeah get quick links to frequently asked questions or user guides, and um, also to contact the support team with uh, inquiries. This is a review of the user guide. Uh, so here, all the uh, ways to work and interact with the VIE are uh, described. Can be quickly accessed. Okay, so um, this was now to give you, uh, yeah, a few uh, a picture of the VIE. Basically, a hands-on understanding of of what exactly how exactly such a platform looks like. And now let's again continue um, with a more, um, yeah, going into the heart and guts of this platform, basically. Um, so now from a user perspective and um, a bit more specific, um, what are the capabilities of uh, this platform, basically? So it um, as a user, you can uh, log in. Um, with your Charité account and in the future we're working towards a federation with other identity providers like ETI check-in or the upcoming EU passports, identity cards. Um, so you can sign in into this um, platform and get them uh, um, yeah, in a protected space the ability to yeah, um, process data via command line and web GUI uh, on Jupyter Lab or with Apache Superset and or um, most importantly in these project specific um, virtual machines that you can also access via such a remote desktop. So there's a virtual machine, an isolated space where you know exactly who has access and um, can together with these persons um, uh, process the data in um, compliance with GDPR. Um, the um, these interfaces um, allow 
um, upload, uh, so typical operations that we would expect from such a platform, like uploading, downloading, or as mentioned, um, this provenance tracking, versioning, um, integration and standardization, um, all in access controlled and um, yeah, generally um, a locked and monitored environment that allows to demonstrate GDPR compliance. And um, in addition, it brings all the advantages of uh, a cloud computing infrastructure. So this is not bound to a certain specific computer, but um, this um, has this high availability and scalability uh, features that a cloud system uh, um, brings with brings with it. So um, you can easily scale up um, a workflow if you see there are more cores or more memory needed. Um, um, and um, since all of these components are containerized, containerized microservices, um, this um, allows it also creates a platform independence and allows an easier, um, yeah, reusing of scientific codes at any system basically. To build such a system is a complex process, especially when you try to build it in a way to be completely independent from any large corporation that tries to create some vendor login or tries to create dependencies, um, which uh, we often experience, uh, not only with large corporations, but with all kinds of corporations. Um, so um, with, um, I think we have very, successful um, IT infrastructure thanks to open source. And we would like to keep it that way. So all of this is open source and um, yeah, can be downloaded and used by anyone. Um, but um, of course this um, creates then also a, a complex process or a complex product, which with many moving and interacting parts. So just to give you a bit of an, um, of an insight into this. So um, this is a Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes is a um, orchestrator for Docker containers. So containerization is a um, technology, uh, one, one of the uh, a super important te technology of the last years. Um, in, the, in the past, it was always a big hustle to uh, install all the libraries and dependencies that you need in order to run a certain code. But with containerization, at least this problem is now solved. And um, the whole code is part of a container, um, which more and more software is ported to. And then when you have it all containerized, then the next step uh, on the ladder of abstraction is to also use such an orchestrator, a scheduler um, that basically makes sure that every container gets the needed resources and routes to communicate with each other. And this is what Kubernetes does here, basically. And this is the major system, the whole blue box, um, which we have um, um, sitting here behind the Charité firewall. So um, to mention, uh, this the Charité uh, has a critical infrastructure of the German government, um, which um, is partly responsible why this was possible, basically. So um, since the whole IT infrastructure of the Charité is um, heavily protected, um, for example, with the Charité firewall and uh, has uh, yeah, to undergo an audit every two years, uh, where all security mechanisms are um, uh, reviewed and, um, if needed, um, improved. Uh, this this um, this makes it possible in the first place to have such a system because we have such a strong security environment. And inside them, um, data flows via such um, 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 ingress controller, uh, where you use engines and um, which is also connected to an API gateway which allows these microservices to interact. So this is, you can imagine like um, every service in the system has an address that can be called and you can request a certain service from a service. And um, by calling it by, via this address, you get them exactly an expected um, response. So I don't think we need to go into the details of the system, but it has many um, of such services that um, interacted uh, create such an ecosystem of um, data processing services. Okay, um, now let's um, jump to something slightly different. 
Um, all of this is also part of other larger projects uh, led by Charité and um, which basically yeah create a pipeline or, or uh, for for reusing and uh, making the most use out of such platforms and the whole technology that is um, created by it. So um, the, the on the on the left side, um, this is project ended now is the virtual brain cloud. Where the major output was exactly the um, virtual research environment and and, and other um, developments, which is now continued as part of the eBrain Health project, which we see here in the middle, where, um, as mentioned, um, the VIE will be used as um, as uh, so the code will be used to set up such a peer-to-peer -peer network of interacting data platforms at multiple different sites that can then exchange um, the data and the metadata in a simple way. And um, moreover, this is uh, feeds into um, the TEF Health project, Testing and Experimentation Facility for Health, AI and Robotics, which is a large EU project about uh, certification of AI products. So as we now will see a large number of AI products that will enter the market, um, they need to be tested and certified for their safety. Um, so basically all the um, uh, legal um, developments that the EU was able to undergo um, with respect to data protection now also feed into these um, goals regarding AI safety. <laughs> Uh, so this uh, TEF Health, um, uh, as mentioned, is uh, um, for um, it's really for um, um, startups or medium and, and also larger enterprises um, to certify their products. So when they create a new AI product, and um, if, I'm sure you have, have heard about this, it's it's uh, very hard with AI to, um, yeah. There's often this black box notion of uh, AI products. Uh, so here the black box um, shall be opened and it should be understood as good as possible and tested as good as possible. And this is a large European project with many nodes um, working together in order to um, create an EU-wide um, uh, test bed for um, AI. So this has, um, yeah, the, the use cases, um, of course, focus on um, on health applications like prevention, diagnostic, treatment, rehabilitation, monitoring, uh, decision support, uh, or even uh, robotic surgery. And um, this involves not only physical testing centers, so um, we're really talking about um, a lab where a robot um, uh, performs certain actions like a surgery, a brain surgery or some or something like that. And uh, then um, this is really then tested basically in on a hardware, on a physical product, but of course also virtual testing centers. And here the problem of the virtual testing centers is the same problem as the data protection uh, problem in itself. So um, we need to protect the privacy of our um, data and um, uh, the, the data for such testing is, is again, um, highly uh, sensitive. And with this, services for startups and SMEs are created uh, to create these European digital innovation hubs, uh, together also with other large-scale European um, uh, initiatives, um, like, for example, the um, European Cancer Imaging Initiative, which also builds a lot of um, European infrastructure where we have um, synergies. And um, yeah, this uh, will then make use um, of these AI regulatory sandboxes um, with the objective to promote innovation and trust while mitigating risks to fundamental rights, health, and uh, safety, which is all part of, um, for example, the upcoming AI Act um new legislation in Europe and subsequently also in the member states um how we will deal with AI products in Europe. So this just to give you a high level overview about what we're doing and now let's take a step back again and um, talk about data privacy and um, the need for data protection. 
So we have petabytes of valuable health data that are generated every year, but we cannot openly share and process human health data as this can easily compromise the privacy of research participants. So um, we have, the problem is that um, such health data reveals a lot of information about health. This is obviously the specific purpose of health data, right? And um, here it's important to understand that we have fingerprints not only at the tips of our fingers, but every cell, every um, yeah, every subcellular element of us um, provides um, um, uniquely identifying characteristics of ourselves. Uh, so even, for example, if we here remove phases from fMRI, from MRI data, this doesn't make the data suddenly non-sensitive. So there's often the idea that um, we just need to remove all directly identifying information and remove everything as good as possible, uh, minimize the data um, down to the purpose um, for uh, which it's being processed. But even then, still then, um, the data is full of um, highly personal information. So even with very simple um, transformations of MRI data, you can infer a lot of highly personal aspects um, that um, about the um, um, health of a person. So um, even with uh, very limited data sets, this works. Uh, so even um, subsets of data sets where really no directly identifying information is um, there can be used. So this, this science article I mentioned here um, is, for example, a very um, interesting example, uh, which I think nicely exemplifies the problem. So um, you may remember that some years ago, there was the Human Genome Project, um, which also uh, then created the human Brain Project, as uh, who, who took over this name, basically, a, a successful name. So the Human Genome Project um, was a big project um, uh, in, in the past where um, the goal was to first sequence a full human genome. So this was a big goal, a big task back then. And um, it was a big success. The first human genome was... Um, was was uh, sequenced and um, the it was also published. So it's really just um, DNA, right? A T G C, <laughs> just base pairs. Nothing. There's nothing in it except of this, these four letters, right? Base pairs. And a few years years later, then um, there came these genealogy websites private companies that offer you home test kits for your DNA and give you some ancestor um, tree. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how this is, what, what this exactly does, but yeah, people then um, home tested themselves and uh, extracted short snippets of their DNA. And this is also published then <laughs> by those um, companies together, for example, with the surname of these persons. And just by using these short snippets, it was possible to re-identify the personal genomes. And um, basically, a large fraction of the population can be identified in this manner. Uh, so with even more and more such data um, um, being generated, the risk of um, identifying someone and um, by linking different data sets, extrapolating or generating even more information about a person increases and will just keep increasing in the future. Therefore, and due to other reasons, the European Union has the General Data Protection Regulation, which clearly governs how in our interconnected world data should be treated um, respectfully, such that um, data subjects, the privacy of data subjects cannot be compromised and the dignity compromised. And um, understanding uh, GDPR is, um, yeah, it's, it's often complex, but on the other hand, it can also be easy if, if we choose the right perspective. So in, in GDPR, we have, for example, only three kinds of people. There are only three roles. Um, nothing else is interesting when it comes to data protection. We only have to think about these three types of people. We have data subjects. So we have persons from which personal data can be collected. Then we have a controller. 
this controller has the means to um, decide the purpose and means of processing. So, for example, if um, someone uh, sends you an email with health data of a certain person, you automatic automatically become a controller of this health data, right? You, you don't need to sign a contract or do anything to become a controller. You could become a controller without your, um, your will, actually. Uh, but the thing is, as soon as you are a controller, you have a certain responsibility under the law. Um, so um, a, a slightly less responsibility as a processor. So this is the third role under GDPR um, who just acts on the instruction of a controller. So if you are working for a company and your boss tells you exactly what you do and you do exactly what your boss tells you to do, then you are not the controller, but just the processor. But if you are the controller, then you have really um, the largest share of the responsibility for protecting the personal data. And you shall then implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure and demonstrate that processing is performed in accordance with GDPR. For example, um, you implement data protection by design and by default, such that by default, personal data are not made accessible without the individual's intervention to an individual number of natural persons. So this is one of the fundamental principles of GDPR um, uh, stipulated here in Article 25. And um, yeah, this is, the, this is in a nutshell, this is um, the whole um, the whole fundamental concern of uh, data protection, right? If you have personal data, don't give it to others, except if you have basically a legal basis for that. And um, here, individual intervention is um, very important. Um, so the data subject um, should always should always be possible for them to stop the processing, to rectify the processing, to delete their data. Um, this really changes how we deal with data, right? You cannot suddenly now, so since GDPR, you now cannot just publish a paper where you um, show the data of individual persons. This was possible all the time, but it's not possible anymore. You could not comply with a request for deletion. As soon as this data is out on the internet, it's everywhere. You cannot control it anymore. You cannot bring it back anymore. You cannot revert it anymore. So. Um, to comply with GDPR, um, you, you have to ensure that um, you are not the leak, basically, that not um, from you data is leaking to the world. And to do this, you shall implement technical and organizational measures to mitigate risks like pseudonymization, encryption, resilience of systems, restoring the availability, regular testing, adherence to codes of contacts, and prevention of unlawful processing. So um, note again here how pseudonymization doesn't make uh, the data um, automatically um, non-GDPR compliant, uh, um, not falling under GDPR. So um, pseudonymization, uh, after pseudonymization, the data is still uh, sensitive. It still falls under GDPR um, if the data is about race, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, political views, which believes genes, biomedics, health. Um, so any MRI scan is health data and cannot be anonymized. You can only anonymize MRI if you average it over many subjects so that you cannot um, revert the process and um, get the information about single subjects. So to really drive home this point again, in the European Union, the processing of health data is forbidden. It's prohibited. You may not do it um, only under very specific conditions. And this uh, condition always boils down to the explicit consent. If you do not, if you do not have a document where a person give, gave their signature, where they explicitly say that they consent to what you are doing with their data, then um, you like to live dangerously because then the um, person can sue you with quite high amounts of money. Um, yeah, that's, uh, so um, processing is um, possible for scientific purposes, but um, only if ultimately the 
um, consent of the subject is a lawful one. And um, usually old consent forms, um, as they, they were used before 2018, were not compliant with GDPR. They didn't even mention uh, what rights the subjects have. Um, so we have, um, yeah, again, um, uh, certain um, uh, uh, stakeholders here. I think I now gave an overview over these uh, different um, elements of our system. Um, we have controllers and processors and data subjects. Um, we have a data protection officer, which is also an important stakeholder at our institution. So we cannot start any processing until the data protection officer and also a supervisory authority has approved this processing. So it's um, it, it's not like in the past. It, the times have really changed and we have to communicate this daily. I daily write emails where I communicate that um, a certain processing operation cannot be done uh, because the um, approval of DPO and supervisory authority are not yet given and the um, guarantees, the need guarantees about the system were not yet achieved. And this is why we are building uh, the VIE and the Health Data Cloud and all these platforms to make it maximally easy for researchers to comply with GDPR and data protection regulation. And um, an important part here is um, certification. So the VIE will now be one of the first, or is now one of the first um, entities that undergoes any certification in the EU. So also we have GDPR since 2018, since five years now, that doesn't even exist a certified infrastructure for processing of health data. Um, so everyone is on their own at the moment, basically. Um, and um, yeah, this is not an, an easy scenario for researchers at the moment. Um, so how do we, um, yeah, which technical and organizational measures do we employ in order to protect the sensitivity of uh, the privacy of data and to comply with data protection law? So as mentioned, a fundamental um, aspect here is the critical infrastructure certification of the Charité, which already certifies all the underlying systems um, as um, the highest level of data protection in Germany. Uh, then um, the isolation of data and resources. So I will go into the details of these technical organizational measures um, later on. Um, just, just, uh, and we will recapitulate them in different forms, um, just to give you a, a high level overview here already. Um, so isolation um, of data and resources and, and um, also different data spaces is of course a, a fundamental concept, sandboxing. Um, being in spaces that are access controlled where no other can access or where only those people can access that have been defined. And uh, of course, the most fundamental and most important security um, method is encryption. Um, without encryption, none of this would work. And um, yeah, this is of course also an, uh, yeah, a, a fundamental um, method to achieve privacy. Authentication, authorization, and access control, um, the last two items here, um, in order to yeah, um, guarantee the identity of the controllers and processors that are um, working with such data. And now um, this um, figure um, that um, I just created to really give you again um, all the background and, and all the, um, yeah, to, uh, yeah, the steps that are needed in order to achieve lawful processing. So um, this is very um, technical and very legal, of course. Um, but um, yeah, just to drive home this point again, that um, it's really nothing that we um, yeah choose. Um, of course, we as researchers, we are, we are, we are in the VIE team, we fully recognize the importance of data protection. Um, but of course, it's a high burden also to live with. And, and just to show you these steps given by the law itself, really, um, that are needed to um, 
to have lawful processing or compliant processing. So, um, so to process health data, we need a lawful basis, um, which is the consent to the processing of specific purposes and compatible purposes. And um, then in addition also we need for this processing a special category of personal data and explicit informed consent um, for the processing for these specified purposes, explicitly mentioning all the subject rights, like the uh, right to be forgotten, the right for um, uh, for correction, and so on. Um, these must be known to the subject. It must be as easy for the subject to accept uh, the processing as to, again, withdraw from the processing. Um, then we can establish the roles um, of the participating um, scientists. Some are controllers, some may be joint controllers, some may be processors, and they need to then um, also um, formalize their relationship and um, have, um, yeah, the, as mentioned, the controller or joint controllers are responsible for compliance with GDPR um, and need to, uh, yeah, take certain steps um, in addition to processors such as designating also a data protection officer and um, um, ensuring that the DPO is involved um, um, properly and in a timely manner, perform a data protection impact assessment, which is um, a long document where every um, technical aspect is explicitly written down, um, like network diagrams, for example, uh, descriptions of the software that is used and so on. And then um, uh, after this was done with the local institution, then also prior consultation with the supervisor authority. So for us in Berlin, this would be the Landesdatenschutzbeauftragte des Landes Berlin, for example. Um, so uh, depending on which level you are working, you need different supervisory authorities. So for example, if you're working across borders, uh, then the super you need a European supervisory authority. You cannot um, just use a national supervisory authority. Uh, and then, um, yeah, you have iterations until you achieve uh, agreement with the stakeholders, and then finally conclude data processing agreement with the controllers and processors. And uh, as a final step, then can um, yeah create a project and start processing. So this um, yeah, our multi-step procedure to establish the lawfulness of the processing. And um, what we're trying to do is basically to make all of this hidden from data subjects and researchers alike, so that in order to consent, the data subject know exactly to which URL they need to go and also to withdraw their consent. And um, it's all part of the same system. And all these steps happen internally um, by technical methods and not like it is now by writing long, long, long word files and Excel files and exchanging them via email and having them in an unstructured process stored. Okay, now let's talk a bit about eBrains. Um, as mentioned, eBrains offers ser several services for neuroscience research, um, like atlases, for example, the human brain atlas, which um, contains really um, a, a finely resolved um, anatomic, anatomical information, um, and um, also the simulation um, services that, um, for example, we from the virtual brain team have been contributing. So one of this is the TVB itself, the virtual brain simulator, to simulate um, brain activity, uh, which can then via graphical user interface and um, giving users uh, new users a bit of a soft start in the whole TVB world. Um, likewise, also um, the pipeline for constructing personalized virtual brains for multimodal neural imaging data. Um, so as mentioned previously, we um, take MRI from subjects and uh, use this to construct brain models. And to do this, this is a yeah, very complex procedure, basically, where um, you need to identify um, which part of the brain belongs to which brain region and where you need to um, yeah, um, process the, the um, yeah, identify the streamlines that connect different brain areas, basically, in this process called tractography. 
Uh, and likewise, also with functional MRI, um, the target for fitting brain models and also which contains um, uh, interesting information uh, is also a complex process. And here we uh, yeah, try to soften the um, newcomers into this world, the, 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 um, the access to this world. Um, yeah, uh, brain world modeling, of course, um, with our um, uh, uh, usual um, large scale modeling approach, of course, is uh, a big focus of uh, these services, but there's also a service for multi scale co simulation where you co can connect um, TVB, the large scale simulator, with Nest or Neuron, for example, and also or Spinnaker um, um, and other um, spiking network simulators. So um, here you can use the large scale activity that was produced by TVB to inform the um, spiking network um, input currents and vice versa can use the activity of the spiking network to inform what happens on a large scale. Also deep brain stimulation is a service that is offered here. Um, so um, where um, yeah, knowledge and um, notebooks and data are made available um, for such multi-scale co-simulation and uh, deep brain stimulation, um, yeah, which uh, was, was here bundled together. Uh, there are also atlases, um, uh, which um, yeah, allowed to, for example, um, visualize receptors, as we can see here, receptor distributions, uh, which is also have also been um, implemented and created by the TVB team here in Berlin. If you think slide twice. Okay. Um, robotics and behavior um, is also another um, part of um, these um, eBrain's use cases. Um, so we have also the, um, the robotics platform in eBrain's and connected this with uh, TVB um, in order to let a brain model inform um, such a robot simulation here. So um, this is a, a famous example about the about wiggling, which can be explained with dynamical system theory, but finger wiggling. So if you wiggle your fingers and get faster and faster, then you will always end up um, in a state where you have this um, in-phase wiggling and not the anti-phase wiggling. Um, system somehow cannot do it and um uh yeah this this had a famous dynamical systems explanation um quite some years back but um, now we use this also now as a first step to connect um virtual brain simulators with robotics um and of course our prime focus with with um uh, or at least my prime focus with um, brain level modeling is to understand um, mechanisms, basically. So to, um, yeah, into basically for me, a brain model is to integrate all the knowledge that we have about brains, basically to express it in a um, mathematical or computational way, basically, and use this then as our computational microscope to really probe into brains and into our theories about how brains work, basically. Um, yeah, eBrains offers this um, um, easier access to these um, different uh, services. They are um, also deployed in various ways, so also as container images or Python notebooks or Python libraries or also as dedicated high performance implementations um, that um, can be used then for massively parallel uh, brain simulation and um, simulating of many parameter sets. Um, we have these connections to Gazebo, the neurobotics platform, as mentioned earlier, and also to the multi-level human brain atlas via the Zebra toolbox, which is also part of eBrains. And all of this is connected via these RESTful APIs, which create such a microservice ecosystem for containerized services to interact and um, yeah, um, uh, work together in a in a um, yeah more nonlinear fashion, so to say. So there's no no linear program and control flow, but such a um, 
uh, ecosystem of services that can work together basically. And eBrains also offers um, certain built-in services um, for, for research, like for example, the knowledge graph, which is an important service uh, for cataloging metadata and um, um, uh, making it findable and reusable. I think I have some slides on this later also. Uh, so one such service is the, um, as mentioned already, the container workflows for building digital twins. So um, basically we uh, try to make this as reusable as possible and um, separate um, different steps of this processing workflow um, into three different containers. So we have um, the first one is um, for structural network extraction. The second one is then for all the FMI processing. The third one then transforms all of this into a um, reusable, um, um, uh, into a TVB ready format. And this is basically part of a, a yeah, bigger strategy um, to make reusable and easily inter implementable workflows as code. So um, I won't go into the details, but this um, lends to a certain new principles in the world of cloud computing, like infrastructure as code, for example. So in the past, um, if you have maybe um, worked as a system admin, um, you know the pain um, of um, managing uh, servers, for example, system administration and so on. And um, all of these things are um, now solved um, by having declarative um, configurations, basically. So you don't manually perform certain steps like installing or setting up a web server, but you have all these containerized um, code and can um, use it by creating such deployment configuration files with Terraform and Helm, for example, um, which specify how a system shall be deployed in Kubernetes. And um, uh, uh, um, we would like to integrate all of this in, in a basically in a hierarchy of, of abstraction to have this full stack of technology in a usable form for researchers and in a reproducible form, basically, where they can then um, at the end, create workflows in the simplest possible manner, ideally by just, um, yeah, maybe um, in a GUI, uh, putting together different elements, um, something like this. Yeah. And we also integrate this with um, other technologies in order to make it reproducible and really on a fine grained level track every computational uh, step. Um, um, yeah, with for here with Datalight, for example, which uh, if we have time, um, may talk about a little bit about um, and yeah with a goal to really end up um, in a world where we have cloud analysis as a service basically where we can really perform scientific research with cloud platforms um, in a yeah meaningful manner um, yeah this is probably you have seen this already in other lectures um, a few of the TVB GUI. It's not a duplicate of what I've actually shown. We can go over this very quickly. Um, but it basically covers um, all these temporal and spatial scales um, of um, brain research, basically. So now with the multi scale simulation, um, we can really tap also into these finer scales. Um, or with our large scale TVB models, we can um, reach towards the causal scales. Um, yeah, this is also probably something that you learned much more about in, or will learn more about in other sessions. Um, just to integrate it here, it's also um, a service um, in eBrains. Um, yeah, virtual brain um, applications for clinical research. So there um, have many um, dedicated uh, studies. Um, uh, so at the moment, I'm, you notice I'm ma making a bit of a scientific interlude again um, to um, yeah give you a bit about the application of all of this, a bit information about what we can do with such data platforms actually. Um, but you probably heard this already in, in some of the other talks and, and will hear it. Um, what are the clinical applications of TBB, for example, for epilepsy 
um, where a clinical trial just ended uh, or for brain tumor research and stroke, um, for example, or dementia. Um, also, yeah, um, um, some other uh, recent um, innovations. So um, as mentioned, we are working a lot of uh, now in the direction of um, brain stimulation, um, and multi-scale simulation, digital drugs, and embodied virtual brains or um, knowledge-based adapters and toiletries. So um, connecting the computational brain model with the neuroscientific um, theory and, and understanding and knowledge um, integration. And um, one of them is also cognitive virtual brains, where we think we made um, some advances to um, yeah, um, having brain models that uh, have a more human-like um, intelligence, basically. Um, uh, also, like this whole um, AGI topic, artificial general intelligence, and then how far um, large language models and so on, ChatGPT, um, really show signs of um, human intelligence, if this is really all that is to human intelligence, or if there's more. But we believe there is more. Um, so um, what we discovered is when you look in fluid intelligence tests, that um, where the, the difficulty of a problem that cannot be learned, but where you have to um, develop an, or reason out the solution while you're working on it, um, that there is a certain flip. So um, usually, the, those um, people with a higher general intelligence, um, they are very quick um, to solve problems. Um, and this is one like one of the longest standing results of intelligence research since the year, since the year 1890, basically. Um, it was shown that for simple tests, like press a button when the color green appears, um, it's very clear, this was demonstrated with hundreds of thousands of subjects that people with higher intelligence are quicker to perform these um, simple tests, which led to the theory or an explanation about human intelligence that people are more intelligent because they have a faster brain, right? Um, the, their brains are somehow faster, and this is the reason why they have a higher intelligence. But here it actually looks like um, the, the higher intelligence people, they used much more time to arrive at the um, correct solution and um, we can actually explain why this um, observation and empirical data may happen so we have from these subjects also fmri data um, and computed their functional connectivity their functional connectomes and um, this showed us that um, independent of their intelligence um, there was a strong correlation between the strengths of functional connectivity the correlation between brain areas and the um, the time they needed to correctly answer the question. Now, completely independent of the complexity of the question, as you can see, so the, the questions are sorted from 1 to 24, and previously there was this flip, right? Before there was this flip from negative correlation to positive correlation, so the um, faster one, the more intelligent ones were suddenly slower. And um, here we see that um, the strength of brain synchronization is somehow related to the um, speed of um, with, with, with which the um, subjects gave the answers. And now to understand this um, on a um, biophysical network level, so how do networks give rise to such behavior? Basically, we now looked at our computational model and studied the computational model um, in more detail. And um, um, here you can see two brain regions, basically. So um, on the left side, we see two brain regions that have a high excitation inhibition ratio. And on the right side, we see two brain regions that have a low excitation inhibition ratio. So uh, on the left side, these two brain regions, they have a strong connectivity between the excitatory populations. But there is not a lot of connectivity from the excitatory to, to the inhibitory populations. Vice versa, on the right-hand side, we see that there is a lot of connectivity from the excitatory populations to the distant inhibitory population. And this leads to a low excitation inhibition ratio. So there's a, a lot of feed forward inhibition. And um, we found that by tuning this excitation inhibition ratio from low to high, we can basically explicitly tune the correlation between any two pairs of brain areas, basically. The, we can set the, the state of synchrony in a brain network or in any network based on the um, configuration of excitation inhibition in this network. 
So this could um, yeah, work for any network where there's a source and a sink of energy, basically. And um, not only between, um, um, so as here, we have one pair of brain areas, right? And But we can also do the same for any pair of brain areas at the same time. And uh, it was really possible. And it turned out that um, with this method, it is possible to tune the functional, the simulated functional connectivity um, with a perfect fit um, to the empirical functional connectivity. So in the end, the simulated and empirical functional co connectivity cannot be differentiated anymore. It's, um, yeah, you get a correlation of um, 0.99, basically. Um, so, um, yeah, this seems to be or could be an explanation. Excitation inhibition balance could be an explanation for functional connectivity, basically. So for us, it was always a big mystery, a big riddle. Um, what governs these networks? How do specific FC patterns emerge? And um, yeah, it turns out, or it seems to be that it's the excitation inhibition structure of a network that gives rise to this state of synchrony in the network, basically. Not only then, of course, the state of synchrony is modulated or functional connectivity, but also other aspects of um, of uh, um, the brain system are modulated by modulating excitation inhibition balance, such as, um, well, this is trivial, the correlation um, on an input level. So also not only the fMRI signal becomes more correlated if we increase long range excitation, but also the input currents that flow into every neuron, into every population of neurons become more correlated. And, but interesting, for example, for the input amplitude, we see such a um, nonlinear pattern. And this we could actually use to explain the different intelligence um, into our group of 650 subjects from which we had these um, brain models and intelligence tests that um, I've shown earlier. So what we did here was we coupled again, then the large scale network now with this small circuit for decision-making. So this circuit is um, a so-called winner-take-all decision-making circuit. Um, so we can see here there comes input. And um, uh, so we have populations A and populations B, as you can see. Um, so these populations A are connected with excitatory connections, red arrows. And um, the populations B are also connected with red arrows. Um, while mutually um, they inhibit each other. So they are blue arrows. So if there comes more evidence for option A, this will inhibit option B and vice versa. So uh, in this, with this mechanism, decisions can be basically formed um, and um, uh, yeah, intelligent um, cognitive processes be performed. So what we did now, we analyzed how this decision-making circuit behaves when we inject it with a kind of activity that we learned in the large scale model. So in the large scale model, we found that the slower subjects had a better solution and a higher FC, higher correlation between brain areas. Now in our model, we found that a higher correlation between brain areas leads to this decreased amplitude of input currents, but to an increased synchrony. And this is what we now tested in this small scale this um, winner take all decision making circuit. So if we decrease the amplitude, um, we get more correct decisions and a higher integration time. And vice versa, if we increase the synchrony of neural activity that goes of this background activity that goes into both um, uh, categories of populations A and B, then also we find that there is a certain sweet spot of intermittent synchrony. It's not when populations are fully synchronized at one, and it's also not when they are totally unsynchronized, it's somewhere in the middle where there's not really synchrony, but there is synchrony. <laughs> and this is where the magic happens, basically, and where information seems to be most efficiently processed. And with this, we went on full circle, basically, and again, showed that decreased amplitude and increased synchrony um, leads to a slower but better solution, which then allows us, basically, in the next step, when we couple again, the large scale brain models with this decision making circuit to um, yeah simulate basically for each of these 650 subjects, a subject specific multi scale brain model. And indeed, the brain models of the smarter subjects made more correct decisions and took more time for decision making, explaining the intelligence behavior of our um, yeah empirical of our real humans.
Okay. Now let's, um, after this short scientific interlude, switch back again to our um, uh, research ecosystems and data platforms. Uh, as you can see, we can really um, find out highly personal um, aspects about humans with brain research. And therefore we need to protect the data. And we do this um, with the virtual research environment and with the health data cloud, which will then uh, use um, instances of this virtual research environment and install it at different sites. So for example, at Oslo University Hospital at ETH Zurich in Jülich, uh, in Switzerland at CSCS, um, we have nodes and these are then connected to exchange metadata and code and data. So we have um, um, also um, yeah, different thematic nodes, so depending on the use cases, um, brain research, AI safety, digital health, and so on. Um, this can then be um, clustered. The health data cloud, uh, you will, um, so this is um, basically a VIE with a re revamp, um, with a nicer user interface. So I guess um, you um, um, will soon then recognize again, yeah, at least here you will recognize again some familiar uh, structure. So this looks very similar in the VIE, where we have this um, front end GUI that allows us to manage files and um, project um, uh, structures. So um, very similar again as in the VIE, we have this um, yeah project overview, file explorer functionality, file search, uh, role based permission management, and so on. And um, yeah, also, and um, now I'm switching back to the uh, VIE, um, have a GUI for creating and um, exporting and importing metadata schemas and for annotating data sets with metadata. So a data set basically um, you can imagine really just as a collection of files um, that is then brought into a certain format or structure. So for example, in neuroscience, we have the BITS format, the brain imaging data standard, which is a widely used prominent uh, standard to organize MRI data, EEG, MEG data, and so on. Uh, we also suggested extensions for the standard um, for computational models, and there are various extensions now for all kinds of data modalities. So this is one aspect of a data set. We organize and structure data in a certain way um, to make it most reusable and, and also to adhere to a certain format that can also be evaluated. Um, with, with, for example, the bits um, standard has the bits value data, which performs checks that um, the data is really in a format that, that makes it reusable. And when you have it then in this format, then you don't need to worry about all these problems that um, scientists are facing um, regarding the fairness of the data. Now, the second ingredient of such a data set is then the metadata. So um, here we can basically create any um, schema, any custom schema, how we would like to annotate um, our data set, for example, we would like to specify which modality at which site it was created. But we can also reuse existing metadata annotation like the Open Minds standard, which um, really um, tries to be exhaustive and to collect everything that is needed to understand neuroscience uh, data. And um, the final ingredient then is then this ability to track the um, changes that are made between versions and to publish these versions as immutable snapshots. And this is what um, we have basically um, in the VIE, um, in the VIE dataset feature, we can yeah, um, bring data in a certain structure. We can um, yeah, release new versions um, and, and integrate it into these datasets basically where we supply all kinds of information and can then um, manage it and um, also validate it, for example. So um, for example, here then there's a button which allows to directly validate validate whether the structure already, already adheres to bits or does not. And uh, then we can add metadata to, um, yeah, 
um, better understand um, the contents of the data set. And as mentioned, either we click together our custom schema or we reuse a schema that was clicked together, or we import um, a schema that adheres to a standard like open minds, for example. So a few more words on metadata and ontologies for fair data reuse. Um, so uh, uh, metadata is data about data, um, but it's often in a machine readable format, um, which allows really them um, to have um, yeah, forms of knowledge discovery and integration that are not possible with unstructured text. So here really the text is structured to adhere to a certain ontology, for example, and to a certain um, yeah, sem semantic um, relationship, basically. So we cannot um, yeah, specify or annotate the, da the data as we want. We have to adhere also here to a certain format, which then helps downstream processes and programs to reuse this data and um, also researchers to find the data. So here, this knowledge graph, for example, is fed completely by these um, open minds metadata annotation. So all the information here is just read out of the metadata record that um, comes with the data and needs to be supplied in order to curate the data. So eBrains has an own curation team. These are really humans that basically look into the data and make sure that the data adheres to the standard given by eBrains. And only then the data or the metadata can be published in the knowledge graph and made findable and reusable. So here you can then search and query the knowledge graph. And um, all of this is not only with such a um, graphical user interface, such a human usable user, user interface, but all of this then can uh, be used together with such um, APIs, RESTful APIs, where also um, machine processes can interact with the data and with these services in a meaningful and organized way. So you can um, implement programs that talk to knowledge graph and um, yeah, perform operations with knowledge graph all um, in an automated way with, uh, with, with very neat and, and cleaned up um, processes and workflows and structures. Um, and ultimately this doesn't exist yet, but um, it's, it's all, uh, yeah, on a conceptual or prototype level still, but um, ultimately is, um, for example, then also computational workflows should be, um, it should be possible to um, create some just by um, creating such um, uh, graphs, for example, by pu putting together different um, elements. So let's have a little bit of a closer look into these metadata records, which are expressed as JSON or JSON as LD files. But this is not um, uh, magic. This is um, in the end also very simple. Um, basically, metadata um, in such JSON format is just um, keys and values. So on the left side of the colon, you see a key like title, and on the right side, you see the actual value. So we specify what kind of information we want to denote. On the left-hand side of the colon and on the right-hand side, we then denote the actual information. And we can structure this um, with brackets and um, and, and and get a nested structure, basically. Um, but the problem here is then, of course, uh, what um, uh, yeah um, does this metadata describe? Are these books? Are these movies? Uh, we need context, and this is really the where the where the magic then happens, um, where basically we then um, have the the ontology structure, the semantic structure um, of this knowledge um, graph um, mapped also into the um, yeah, structure of the files that um, encode and store this knowledge, basically. And um, so instead of having um, um, values that are just simple text or, or, or numbers, we could also have values that are references, again, to other JSON files or to JSON schemas that prescribe a certain format. And with this, we can then link different JSON files and metadata records and then really achieve a knowledge graph. So um, this knowledge graph, this is really a graph. This is not an, a relational database as it was in the past where you have a huge table 
and everything is just um, written in a tabular linear format where you strictly must adhere to this format and have no flexibility whatsoever. This is a graph. This is all just links between entities. So data sets are linked. Um, data set metadata is linked and it can also be traversed, right? You can then have automatic processes that traverse this graph and again, compute and extract novel information um, from such a knowledge graph that is encoded as JSON or JSON LD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a more advanced JSON LD structure. So, as mentioned, we can nest this to an arbitrary depth and can, with this, of course, represent very complex forms of information. And uh, by linking it, by nesting and linking, yeah, we arrive at, uh, uh, at our full knowledge graph structure. And this allows then. Yeah, to um, already validate also metadata, for example, uh, here only on a syntactical level. This is, of course, very simple. Is the data type correct, at least? But um, also then on a semantic level, basically, um, governed by the relationships between different entities in a knowledge graph. And open minds here, the metadata standard is used by knowledge graph and also um, in our research to um, annotate the contents of a data set. Um, yeah, goes to over great lengths basically and provides a lot of um, yeah entities to yeah specify data. Um, so we have, for example, the core part of Open Minds to describe origin, location, and contents of research products. Like, who are the authors? Um, what kind of subjects are in this data? Um, subject information, demographic information, the data types, and so on. And then open mind sense also to describe um, the anatomical anchoring of this data in, in terms of anatomical atlases and all of this um, using control terms basically that are linked to a matching ontology term such that um, it's really 100% clear what every element means. And um, yeah, this gives them rise to such an extensive um, schema um, uh, description where which allows to specify all kinds of um, metadata elements, the actors that participated in the study, the data itself, um, licenses, DOIs, um, URLs, yeah, versions, projects, softwares, and so on, all kinds of information. Okay. And um, yeah, back to the VIE and the VIE then um, this um, again uh, is then yeah, packaged into a, a more nicer format basically to allow this um, provenance tracking and versioning um, uh, of data sets that are annotated with metadata and structured. A more lightweight way for structuring data is given by the VIE in the form of so-called collections. So collections are just virtual folders where you can locally group your files without actually affecting the storage or lineage. The lineage is really the um, provenance track or this history um, of a digital object. Um, so for example, from the time it was uploaded to the system and the person who uploaded it and all intermediate steps when it was maybe copied or first uh, minimized in green room and then copy to core and so on. We can create a lineage um, just like um, oil paintings, expensive oil paintings have a provenance and their lineage. Um, also our um, research data has their lineage as it's also very valuable. Um, yeah, it's just a short video how you can access this um, information. So every file has them a, a um, global um, unique identifier that allows to identify it and to integrate it in such a lineage basically and to um, traverse then all nodes um, so this can become very complex of course um, uh, that led to the current state um, yeah as mentioned just to briefly recapitulate um, all of or most of the things I talked about um, concern the management of data, the governance of data. Um, but of course, at some point, data also should be processed in order to create scientific insights. And again, this is um, doable in the uh, private virtual machines or the more lightweight Jupyter Hub. 
instances which are part of every project. So a project is the main organizational unit of the VIE and contains a team of researchers together with a certain specific health data set that is processed for a specific purpose, consonant to by the data subject and fulfilled by a specified team of controllers and processors as defined in a processing agreement. And then um, when um, the data uh, then enters the VIE, as mentioned, it can only do so via the green room, which is the place where it can be safely minimized. So um, here the data is only visible to the uploader and the uploader has the chance to um, minimize the data. So this is one of the um, fundamental principles of GDPR, the principle of data minimization and purpose limitation to reduce a data set down to the minimum set that is needed for the purposes of the processing. So here in the green room, for example, a data controller can say faces are clearly not needed in this MRI data for the processing. So I can remove these faces. But again, there may be research questions that actually require faces. So there may be uh, research on, I don't know, the uh, yeah something that has to do with faces. And then we, of course, don't want to um, remove these faces and keep them in our MRI data. So in this case, then removing faces would not be purpose limitation and data minimization. So this is something that the data controller decides after they uploaded the data to the green room and can then still safely minimize before then really exposing the data to the entire project team in the call zone by this copy to core operation. In the call zone, then um, again, um, we can do all these operations that I mentioned earlier for structuring and annotating the data and also for processing the data. Um, at this point, it can even be downloaded to a local file system because all these operations of exposure of data um, between different peoples have been tracked and um, create a record of um, data flows that can be used to demonstrate GDPR compliance in the case of data breaches. So this is an important element um, when um, a data breach happens, basically, in order to for a call to decide which fines will be handed out to the people um, they, um, yeah, post hoc um, uh, uh, data breach analysis then is, is uh, the method of choice basically to analyze how a breach could happen and who is responsible and um, yeah, who needs to be punished for that. Um, utility zone is just uh, such a separate zone um, of the VIE, um, where data flows between different subsystems uh, can be um, managed in a more secure way. So the different zones themselves cannot do things with data, but the utility zone basically provides services that takes the data from somewhere and puts it somewhere, um, like an intermediate um, uh, 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 um, neutral service. Um, workbenches, as mentioned, um, is primarily Apache Guacamole remote desktop and command line interface on a private virtual machine or Jupyter Hub, a more lightweight uh, way, um, which is user specific with 10 gigabytes per user for um, some quick Python uh, programming and, and um, um, workflowing. Um, but of course, the VMs with 8 to 24 cores or up to 128 gigabyte of memory um, are then for, yeah, offer the full flexibility to researchers to perform any kind of data processing that is needed for the research. Um, then up to now, we um, didn't really uh, touch the command line interface, but it's an important part. So of course, it's nice to work with GUIs, um, but it's all only nice as long as the work that you do is not repetitive. As soon as it becomes repetitive, um, it's uh, it's not very nice to work with GUIs and you wish to be able to automate this and um, with the command line interface, this is very nicely possible. So this is really a um, Linux or Mac OS terminal program that um, allows to perform all the usual operations that can be done by the GUI via command line, like uploading files, downloading files, 
um, structuring them and so on, can here be combined with all the typical Linux or Mac OS command line programs and terminal functionalities. So for example, um, a user can log in or log out of a project. They can list the projects that are accessible to them. They can view annotated export metadata, list, upload, and download files and folders, or synchronize the state in the VIE with their local file system. Um, download data sets and um, also um, work with HPC or Knowledge Graph. Speaking about HPC, the VIE has a backend high performance computer where computational intensive tasks can be run. Um, so these are there are many cores um, and a lot of storage um, to run um, highly compute and memory intensive um, workflows. So a typical um, process would be probably you start maybe in the very first step you make some easy analysis on Jupyter with your Jupyter Hub with a Jupyter Hub notebook, and then um, you need more resources. You need to exchange with your team. You go to the VM and can then on eight to twenty four cores work together with your team and a shared file system. And then if you um, create a workflow that works for a single data set and all that is now needed to do is to apply the workflow to 1000 data sets, then you can move this workflow um, if it's containerized ideally um, to the HPC and just apply the workflow on 1000 data sets. I mentioned most of these things. Let's jump over them. So many of these things are a bit repetitive, repetitive to um, yeah, really drive home the point. Um, yeah, we have a lot of um, yeah inbuilt features. So this is this privacy by design and by default. So this is really the the governing principle. In addition to fairness of the VIE and the Health Data Cloud, um, is to have baked in privacy. Basically, the system itself should be built such that um, it. Um, yeah, decreases the risk of a data breach as far as possible. And for example, um, a, a big firewall is helpful. Then um, also the fact that there's no direct user interaction, but uh, so no direct access to the actual hardware like storage or databases or services, mm -hmm. but um, it only happens via these managed and um, controlled routes via the GUI or the command line interface. Uh, isolate spaces, um, uh, IP tables, um, and of course the microservice architecture also um, loosely coupled but highly cohesive um, lends a lot uh, to these security features, but also to availability and um, integrity features. So not only confidentiality, confidentiality um, is a concern, of ours, but also integrity and availability. So of course we also wish that the system doesn't um, suddenly vanish and your data is gone, but um, we try to um, yeah, have um, of course archived backups and mirroring of data and so on in order to um, yeah, achieve these goals. So um, as we are reaching slowly the end of our session, I, um, I think since I mentioned this already previously, I won't go into the details of architecture and um, this user perspective and also not into these very detailed accounts of um, the um, internals of the VIE, um, but rather jump a bit more quickly about over the um, yeah, remaining slides. Um, yeah, um, so we're really going over great lengths um, to uh, ensure the security. This is a um, yeah, long and um, um, formal process. Um, so as mentioned, this uh, along the critical infrastructure certification uh, with um, biannual audits um, yeah, creates a huge, huge demands on bureaucratic burdens basically um, uh, to um, document and, and yeah, um, enable such um, uh, certification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shared responsibilities, of course, are, are 
a big um, uh, um, aspect here. Um, so every um, every part of this, every person who is part of such a team or on such such a process um, shares some responsibility. Um, no one has all the responsibility and no one has no responsibility, but um, everyone shares uh, a certain part of the responsibility and we try to yeah have a meaningful balance. Uh, strike a meaningful balance between different um, responsibilities and um, have it um, technologically streamlined and organized as far as possible so that users um, yeah, have it very easy to comply with the law, basically. Of course, there are scanners also um, who check uh, this system and performs vulnerability scans. Um, for example, the Greenbone open bus scanner um, with daily actualized um, vulnerability tests, um, which was also partially developed by um, our German um, 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 office for um, security and information technology, um, um, which basically really, um, yeah, tries to not only find um, typical technological um, attack vectors like viruses, worms, and so on, but also organizational uh, attack vectors, basically, organizational flaws in the whole setup of the system, basically. Um, yeah, there's a fine-grained access control. Let's talk a bit about um, user roles. Um, so we have um, four um, yeah, relevant user roles in the VIE. There is just, a just, for example, a registered platform member who all they can do is view and list the projects in the VIE. So this has no permissions whatsoever. And then the next higher um, role is contributor uh, who can already um, access a project in the VAE, but they can only upload files. So here, um, these contributors, they may have not the legal basis for accessing the data of anyone else, but they can at least contribute data and make it available to the project. A collaborator then already can analyze data in VAE core. So this would be a classical processor role, someone who fulfills the processing job, um, then works with the data. And then finally, a project administrator can um, add people to the project and can copy data from the green room into the core zone and really expose others uh, to this data. Um, yeah, let's jump over the details of how um, yeah, security is um, implemented. Um, yeah, and let me uh, look how we close the session. I will now make a bigger jump because what comes now um, is just details of what I have explained earlier. I'm just looking whether we have something to wrap this up a bit. These slides are really just for, it's a long presentation, but it's for completeness. Um, it's not, um, yeah. Yeah, maybe um, as, a, as a final element of this talk, um, I, I would like to talk a little bit about reproducibility again and, and data led. So the problems that um, are often encountered, so when you read these sentences, um, these are typical sentences that you get when you try to do meaningful research. And they sound so naive and simple and, and even stupid, but this is really um, a lot of um, where a lot of problems come from. Um, and um, this is now really a big pain point now, now it, so, yeah, often when the problem is, is ignored, it, it just continues to grow until it cannot be ignored anymore. And this is, I think, what, what happens. So 
1995, um, these two um, researchers, Buckheit and Donohue, already realized that um, with digital research, um, a paper, an article is really just an advertisement. The actual scholarship is the complete software development environment, the complete set of instructions which generates the figures. Um, so really these beautiful figures, this just advertisement, it's nice, but um, what is the actual knowledge that's created is the code that um, created the figures. And um, this code must work. If it doesn't work, then the science is not reproducible. And if it's not reproducible, it's not existent, more or less. So um, this is um, where we are right now. And um, yeah, we really would like to achieve a level, a, a state of reproducibility um, where we yeah can um, yeah even achieve um, Reproduce, reproduction on different systems and the ultimate um, or different um, uh, uh, media, um, the ultimate form of, of reproduction then. And uh, for achieving reproducible um, systems, we can really learn, learn a lot from the way how software is developed in organizations. So the whole GitHub and Git um, way of doing things. Uh, so if you don't, um, if you didn't, develop software before and um, didn't work with github you probably don't know what i'm talking about um but github is really a valuable um uh, a very valuable um concept and, and software and data led is basically good for data so um git of course, tracks changes on a line by line basis. And um, this would be a bit of an overkill for scientific data sets where we have gigabytes or terabytes of data. We, we cannot track every small change. This would lead to enormous um, data sizes. But we can at least create um, hashes of the data of this large data set and with this um, have a protocol flow and, and um, uh, a, 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 a um, assurable flow of processing steps, basically. And um, data lab does just this, basically. It um, ports the whole Git logic um, onto um, any kind of data set, basically. So now any folder um, can basically from it, so when the raw data was created, up to the final figures and the final papers, A and B, and with all diverging and forking analyzers, A, B, C, and so on. Uh, all of this, uh, this whole network, this whole flow of processing from the raw data to the final figure can be managed and organized and um, yeah, stored in a re reproducible fashion with this data led and Git logic, basically, which is yeah, very helpful to really make data um, explicitly um, reproducible or workflows explicitly reproducible. And with this, I'm at the end of this presentation and thank you for your attention.